I have an embarrassing confession to make. A few years ago, poopery would have made a very good Father's Day gift for me and an even more thoughtful one for my family. What can be done of that subtle scent of a... 300 cow dairy farm. Aerosol air fresheners aren't the most effective option or the healthiest. So, how do you make the world believe your poop doesn't stink? Or in fact, that you never poop at all? Poopery. Uh, I thought I had been dealt a very unfortunate genetic hand, and there was nothing to be done but to keep a bottle of poopery royal flush handy to hide my shame. My stomach had always been this way. It simply boiled and roiled a lot. As much as I loved the Alka-Seltzer ads when I was a teen, plop, plop, fizz, fizz didn't work for me. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. You ate it, Ralph. I can't believe I ate that whole thing. Take two, Alka-Seltzer. I guess I thought, I do Ironman triathlons, which make you eat a ton, so the engine's got to boil and toil to process 5,000 calories per day, right? I don't have the genes for celiac disease that can produce symptoms like that, and I had read that only maybe 16% of people who think they have gluten intolerance actually do. But just in case, I eliminated gluten for 90 days, and as if by magic, a lifetime of symptoms vanished. Major spousal points. Hmm... Here's the crazy thing. After the 90 days, I tried to reintroduce whole wheat bread again and no symptoms. How could that be? Does your doctor have a poop chart on the wall showing how they're supposed to look? In my life, I had never scored a bullseye on that chart and now I was a master of it while eating wheat. I just shrugged it off and thought, anecdote. We'll probably never know why and let's just hope it doesn't return. But then a family member took a very sophisticated wheat sensitivity test with an incomprehensible list of chemical indicators that indicated she had major non-gluten wheat sensitivity. So I went on a fascinating journey of discovery to see if there's a simple explanation we can all understand for why we're seeing gluten-free labels everywhere. In this episode, I'll take you on my journey and hopefully by the end of the episode, you'll be saying, ah, okay, this is starting to make some sense. The first thing that jumped out me is how doctors, scientists, and food companies all use the terms wheat and gluten without explaining what they mean. Do they mean this? What about this? What about ancient forms of wheat like einkorn and spelt? The original wheat is einkorn, a simple plant that's found in the wild. Archaeologists believe they have evidence that primitive humans gathered it to eat at least 30,000 years ago. It makes for beautiful wavy green fields because the stalks are tall and the seeds on top are small and light. Somehow some renegade einkorn got together with goat grass more than 10,000 years ago and each of them took the rare step of pooling their 14 chromosomes, becoming the 28 chromosome wheat emmer, which also grows wild. And then emmer got together with another goat grass maybe 6,000 years ago to form the 42 chromosome spelt, the first bread wheat. All three played a huge role in the formation of civilization and the rise of Egyptian, Phoenician, and Roman empires. Early grains had heavy husks, which protected them against insects so they could be grown without herbicides. But removing the husks was a lot of work. The killer feature among 42 chromosome bread wheat that caused it to become the most popular grain in the world is the strong elastic gluten that let the bread rise so high. The public preferred the color of bread wheat to be white, not the yellow of older wheat, so breeders obliged unwittingly breeding out the healthy orange and yellow carotenoids. The steel mill revolution of the 1870s made it easier to separate the bran and germs, so it essentially put the stone grinding mills out of business, making bread even whiter. Wheat breeders obliged the millers and made the bran hard and brittle, easy to chip off, but bad for foods like whole grain pasta because the bran made for a hard, scratchy texture. Italians love their pasta, however. Buon appetito. So they stuck with durum wheat. You need semolino, durum wheat which is yellow, soft, and sticks together. It has a different, more nutritious profile. And this is where our story becomes absolutely astonishing. <laughs> FDR and Harry Truman became very concerned about starving nations like Mexico, India, and Pakistan, so they helped convince the Rockefeller Foundation to fund a small plant research outpost in Mexico. They recruited an idealistic young plant scientist who left his cushy job at DuPont for an opportunity to help solve world hunger. 
He was influenced by the starvation he saw in American cities during the Depression. So he labored in obscurity for years in primitive conditions in Mexico, working in the fields for 12 hours a day to crossbreed wheat varieties to get resistance to disease and high yields. After years of fighting with his bosses and other plant breeders who thought his methods were crazy, his long-suffering saint of a wife, Margaret, drove out to the field where he was working with a co-worker, got herself on the wrong side of a canal, and shouted across the field, Norman, you've won the Nobel Prize! And he shouted back and waved and went back to work until an Associated Press reporter paid some kids some pesos in town to tell him where Dr. Borlaug was. Dr. Borlaug went on to be awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, 50 honorary doctorates, and the highest civilian honors you can receive from countries like Mexico, Pakistan, and India. There's a statue of him in the Capitol Rotunda. He's considered the father of the Green Revolution, who may have saved as many as 2 billion people from starvation. 95% of the wheat we eat today comes from his disease-resistant, high-yield varieties. The other 5% is mainly durum for Italian-style pasta. I laugh when I think of all the research methods that Norman used to make so many breakthroughs with his wheat. Wheat is self-pollinating, so it takes a lot of dexterity with tweezers to figure out how to cross-pollinate different varieties of wheat. So he recruited what must have been future Rubik's Cube stars from nearby towns and paid them some pesos to work the tweezers. He was already paying some of them to chase birds from the fields, and this way they could earn enough money to go to school, and he could speed up his plant breeding revolution. I found a book written by one of his colleagues, Noel Wietmeyer, that was so fascinating, I blew off a whole night's sleep to read it. Norman had a long list of criteria for his best varieties, the first of which was disease resistance. Unfortunately, disease resistance is usually orthogonal to nutritional content, unless, of course, you can achieve it by mechanical means like a heavy husk. Hmm, like the heavy husks that ancient grains had that help them fight off insects and grow in the wild. Here's a food made resistant to bacteria and fungus. They've been sitting out on my counter for eight months, and so far, no bacteria or fungus has touched them. We have cockroaches out in our backyard, so I set some Twinkies out at night to see if there are any cockroach takers. I apologize in advance for my poor cockroach language skills, but I think this is what their leader told me. Yeah, what do you think? We're stupid or something? We're not touching that cockroach poison. Why don't you give it to some human children and see if they develop weed intolerance or something? Hey! But say, why don't you spread a few of them einkorn kernels out in the backyard? Delicious. So the next criteria for Norman was yield, and he famously figured out that he could grow big heads of wheat on dwarf stalks, and the heads could be heavy and still not break the stalks. And he bred varieties that could tolerate heavy doses of nitrogen to grow big berries, and that was a bonanza for the big chemical companies who had every incentive to promote his wheat. And he had to please the bakers who wanted strong gluten to make the bread raise high, and the millers who wanted easy-to-mill wheat. Nutrition wasn't something he could test for or think about, and he was a strong believer in chemicals like DDT. So armed with that context around wheat, I was eager to hear what doctors say who recommend gluten-free diets. There's Dr. Davis, who wrote Wheat Belly, no wheat, no grains, especially modern wheat, modern high-yield semi-dwarf wheat created in the laboratory. Dr. Perlmutter, who sometimes appears in vegan conferences. Uh, I, I make sure, as best I can, that my patients get the message that they've got to ditch gluten 100%. Here's the thing. Totally gluten-free diets are difficult. They send you to other hyper-industrialized foods that have their own set of problems. And you have to ignore the overwhelming amount of research that says for a large majority of people, whole grains are super healthy. It is very important to have a medical diagnosis before starting any restrictive diet. If you have celiac disease, this is a medical indication for a gluten-free diet. If you are not celiac, then it is not that clear that a gluten-free diet is going to be the healthiest option for you. When you do a gluten-free diet, you are withdrawing fiber, fermentable foods that are important for your gut health. So I wanted to know what doctors say who recommend diets high in whole grains like the Mediterranean and vegan diets. Here's the gastroenterologist, Will Bolsowitz, who wrote the book Fiber Fueled. You must carry the gene for celiac to get it. About 35% of Americans carry the gene for celiac disease, but only 1% manifest the disease. In the last 50 years, we've seen a 500% increase in celiac disease. So what explains the rapid increase? Dr. Elena Verdu from McMaster University in Canada showed us through a series of eloquent studies that there are three criteria that must be met to develop celiac disease. One, presence of the gene. Two, exposure to gluten. And three, you guessed it, alteration or damage to the gut microbiota. Fascinating, but I would have thought me and my family member who had wheat sensitivity had champion microbiomes. 
We both don't eat any refined foods, and I've hardly ever had antibiotics, certainly not any strong ones. Uh, what about so-called ancient grains? Are they any better than modern varieties? There was Dr. Greger, who did a video on studies comparing the heritage wheat kamut to the wheat most of us are eating, and the health differences seem stunning to me. So after switching to the ancient grain, patients experienced a significant global improvement in the extent and severity of symptoms related to their irritable bowel. What about liver inflammation? The liver function of those with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, randomized to eat kamut, improved compared to those eating the same amount of regular wheat, right? suggesting kamut is superior in diabetics, better cholesterol and insulin sensitivity on the same ancient grain, in those with heart disease, better blood sugar control, and better cholesterol, better artery function in those without overt heart disease. The bottom line is findings derived from human studies suggest that ancient wheat products are more anti-inflammatory and improve things like blood sugar control and cholesterol. But that was a short video, and I wanted more. One thing that was disturbing, at least to me, is the diet doctors often use the word rare, referring to celiac disease. Actually, the definition of rare diseases in America is 1 in 200,000, and celiac is more like 1 in 100, and non-celiac wheat sensitivity may be even higher than that. So I turned to doctors who specialize in celiac disease and learned some fascinating things. Because at the time, the accepted prevalence of celiac disease in the U.S. was in the order of 1 in 5,000, but that has changed dramatically. The most frequent way the disease presents today is anemia, and with that, chronic fatigue. We used to think that oats was a problem, but it seems in retrospect oats was contaminated with wheat flour during the milling and the processing part, so that's why it was implicated. For many, many years, people have wondered why it's so variable. You can have celiac disease presenting very early, you can have celiac disease preventing late, you can have severe symptoms, minor symptoms, and so people have often suggested that there's an additional trigger factor. You have the gene, you eat the wheat, but there's additional trigger factor that then precipitates the disease. So what we have found is that the bacteria that you have in your small intestine will significantly contribute to the digestion and modification of those peptides. So yes, fascinating, but still hardly any mention of the characteristics of the wheat we're consuming. If only there were a plant scientist who understood wheat and modern farming practices and was involved in human health studies. That would be the man or the woman of the hour, but sadly to me it sounded like a unicorn that probably doesn't exist. And that's when I discovered an amazing book by unicorn Bob Quinn, PhD plant biochemist, organic farmer specializing in Kamut ancient wheat, and the man behind the studies Dr. Greger cited earlier in this episode. Oh, I'm glad you wore your big hat. Oh yeah, I couldn't. I feel half naked without it, you know. <laughs> oh, you look good in that. And uh, that's your wheat in your hat. Yeah, that's the Kamut. Oh, that's really great. You think people's sensitivity to wheat is somewhere around 12 to 20 percent now? That's what the literature says. I've also heard you say there are four things uh, that are contributing to it. Well, I tell people that have trouble, there are four things you can do to probably give yourself an 85 to 95 percent chance, a real high chance that you can no longer have trouble with wheat. So the first one is to eat only ancient heirloom varieties and make sure that that's what they are and it's just not some fancy marketing thing. The second is to eat only organic so you don't have the possibility of having um, eating chemical residues. Um, glyphosate, for example, uh, which is the main component of Roundup, um, imitates some of the same symptoms that people feel uh, and blame on wheat sensitivity. Glyphosate is, a, is an antibiotic too, right? It is, and that's how it works. The third thing is eat whole grain. And the fourth thing I'd say to people is to um, eat sourdough. If you're going to eat bread, eat sourdough, because sourdough is a um, fermentation. It's made from bread that's been fermented for at least overnight, sometimes 24 hours, sometimes longer than that, particularly if they're refrigerating it. And it's being fermented by a combination of yeast and bacteria. And uh, within 40, 48 hours, about 90% of your gluten is destroyed. So even in 24 hours, or even 12 hours, you're getting a significant reduction in gluten the way it exists in uh, yeasted bread. And, and yeasted bread, as I mentioned earlier, is made with fast rising yeast. It doesn't, and the bakers don't even give it time to start to digest the, um, 
the gluten or the starch in the bread because they add sugar to the bread and the yeast is immediately attacking the sugar because it's so simple to break down. Any one of those um, four will help you, but putting all four together will give you the maximum possibility for being able to enjoy wheat again. A lot of conventional bread is from dough to loaf in about four hours. Our sourdoughs and our breads take about 60 hours. Now watch your heads as you come down here. We start soakers and pre-ferments on one day. This is our sourdough soaker. This will start fermenting naturally. Good bread in the bakehouse starts here. We come in the following day and we incorporate them into a dough, usually with some sourdough starter for, for leavening. We bulk ferment them for about four hours before shaping them. And those will ferment overnight in the cooler. Let's just see how you do on this ingredient list. Okay. <clears throat> are, you, are you keeping tally? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this is a big brand. Yeah. This is Orwe. No, the main claim here is that it's double the fiber. Okay. So double than what? Uh, what does that mean? That's double. <laughs> <laughs> double than what? <laughs> well, their wheat must be better than your wheat because this wheat has it's double the fiber. Single, right. We use all the fiber that it comes with, so I guess that's only a single. <laughs> <laughs> this has 36 grams of whole grains per two slices. I don't know what that means. Well, and the package that I got a couple of months ago said no nonsense ingredients. So oh. don't be calling any of this nonsense. I noticed they took that off the, the ingredients list now. Okay. <laughs> whole wheat whole wheat flour, we know something about that. Water, wheat gluten. Yeah. So they're adding wheat gluten. Yep. And it, sugar. Yeah. Wheat, modified wheat starch. The wheat gluten's probably coming from Europe because they have access to send to us after they make starch out of it. So oh. and it's added to a lot of bread to help it to rise even more. I see. Modified wheat starch. What does that mean? I don't know what how they're modifying it. I don't. I wouldn't. I don't know. I'm going to have to dock you one point on that. Yeah, I. I can. <laughs> cellulose fiber. Cellulose is from wood. Um, so, so they're adding wood pulp to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that doesn't market. Why not? Well, right. That doesn't market quite as well. You really? They're adding wood pulp to ice cream and everything else? I don't know if it's... Well, it's you know. fiber. I mean, everybody wants more fiber. Instead of eating the plants whole, Yeah. novel idea, um, then we add something like... Wood chips. Probably a lot cheaper. <laughs> we know there's a lot of... I'll have some wood chips around. So. Yeah, next time I take down one of my trees, I'll know to grind it up and That's throw it in the food. <laughs> bread loaf. Just to be clear, Bob's recommendations were for people who have wheat sensitivity, not celiac disease. People with celiac can't even have heritage sourdough. Bob is such a jewel, I'll post a complete interview in a few days. So after all that, what are my conclusions? The first one is that the big agricultural companies are turning wheat into an unhealthy factory food. Just like they're doing with other foods where they can make billions by turning agriculture into a chemical and antibiotic arms race. The second is that as scary as celiac disease is, it doesn't compare to the diseases like cancer and heart attacks we get from animal and refined foods. If you do get celiac disease, at least you can make a complete recovery with foods like oats, quinoa, rice, and buckwheat. If you go on a gluten-free diet, that is the landmark treatment of celiac disease, you completely revert the autoimmune process because these people will have no symptoms anymore and the damage of the intestine that is the old mark of the autoimmune insult is gone. When I started eating wheat again, we went for organically grown heritage wheats, and maybe that's what made the difference. We're lucky to have a great bakery nearby that sells organic sourdough heritage breads. Mmm. Turns out you can make awesome sourdough breads from heritage grains. Who knew? Mm. On behalf of our new favorite unicorn, thank you so much for watching. We hope you'll give it a like. We'd love to read your comments. And can I just say that Kamut bread with a little nut butter on it really is delicious. Mm. Mm. Oh yeah.